Dean Obadala. He wants to be your Muslim friend. Most Muslims, I know many, are great people. Watch this. People. You're listening to The Dean Obadala Show, where comedy meets politics and all things in between. And welcome back to the Nobi Dollar Show. We're live right here Wednesday, March 13th. Now we're live in studio. Jameer Burley, internationally recognized speaker, social justice advocate. She's guest host on this channel, on this show. Not the, at the times I think this show, not since I've been here, but we'll make that happen. She's a millennial vote director at Hillary for America, managed gun violence and criminal justice initiatives at Amnesty International. Very nice to meet you in person, my friend. Nice to meet you too. I am your residential millennial. How are you? You are. So you're going to answer all things millennial, including about reparations. That of was course, a topic. We're, we're all Facebook friends. That's it. So, but Facebook's not working today. So <laughs> it is. The world is over. This is basically. I, I, I think Instagram is more upsetting to younger people than Facebook being down. Yeah. So many people checked out Instagram down today. But it's weird. I mean, on a serious note, for Instagram and Facebook to be down all day, mm-hmm. and these are the most sophisticated companies. Something bad happened. Like I think a it's cyber Elizabeth attack. Warren. She she, oh, she definitely <laughs> said she wanted to break them up. <laughs> she was just she did her it. word. So she's like a vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> they trust breaker upper. No, that's it I can only imagine. I don't know what happened, but for huge companies like this to mm-hmm. be down maybe a cyber attack by the Russian government yeah. or someone. It's also scary because it's a lot of information we've shared on both of those sites. So it's just like if it was a an internet attack or um, in some form. It's like now you have access to so many people's data and information and messaging and whatever. And the crazy thing is that they want to now combine all the messaging. So like WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram messaging together. So imagine if that happens at the same time, how much of your information would be on the World Wide Web. That's not good at all. Yeah. That makes it, so, all right. So let's talk about the issue we've been talking about the last mm-hmm. hour and we'll try to take some calls as well. But Reparations. Let me ask you, as a millennial, what what does that mean to you? Just the concept of reparations. I think for me, as a as a millennial, um, reparations as an African American millennial at that is the idea of a government admitting what it did was legally wrong, like healing and creating a space for healing and reconciliation, and then compensating those in which they done something wrong to. And for me, when I, as an African American looking back on the history of this country and those we have compensated for wrong that we have done, and African Americans being the only one of the only populations who haven't and who have committed more than 400 years of service as slaves, additional years of service as individuals who are still not properly comp- compensated among, amongst a num- number of different industries, and yet people are looking at it as something as so trivial as just writing a check. We're we're talking about systems that have oppressed. We're talking about criminal justice systems that have still incarcerated folks and are still working for free. So it's a it's it's not only just looking at the 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 implications of slavery, but also the systematic ways in which the U.S. government continues to perpetuate racial um, divide in this country. So among African American millennials, is this a topic that comes up much? The idea of reparations on some level, or even as a, a discussion point, more so now than ever. But and and I say that only because often to your point that we were talking off um, line is that we never thought it was valuable. I mean, viable. Right. But when we think about the other r- reforms that we're asking for, it is a reflection of the continuous discrimination and oppression that the U.S. government has had on those who are um, who are. Uh, who are um, children of of slavery, like of slavery. Right. yeah, descendants of slavery, and so reparations in some form or fashion has to encompass all the things that have happened to individuals during and after slavery to this day. So, is there any consensus in the discussions that you have? Because it's such a hard question. I went through all the candidates from 2020 who have spoke about reparations: Senator Kamala Harris, Liz Warren, Bernie, everyone, almost Cory Booker, and every single one. Their prescription has been universal, not specific to the African American community. <laughs> yeah, and and I I get the sense that I I know what's going on because if you're going to say you want something very specific for the black community, you in their view there's a zero sum game and there's some white people I don't think are ever going to support Democrats anyway, but yeah. maybe you put them off. Or some people say it's unfair, and some people frame this as it's a white black issue when it's not. It's a government issue to people they've wronged and the sentence of people yeah. they've wronged. It's not white versus black. No one's saying white people have to pay for this. Collectively as a nation, when we do something wrong, mm-hmm. someone's got to pay the bills here. But are there is there any candidate talking about this issue in a way? Because first of all, no one talked about it in 2016. Oh, yeah. President Obama would. Was not I mean, it took of it. Oprah's spiritual advisor to bring it to the national stage. Interesting. <laughs> so it's uh, for me, it's like we're now at a point where, for so long, it's 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 
it's the same reason where people are talking about if you, if you people are more afraid to be labeled a socialist than they are a racist in this country. And that says so much about where we are as a country, the fact that we are so afraid to recognize that minority groups, both not just African-Americans, we're talking about indigenous youth, we're talking about Muslims, how each of these groups are diff- treated differently in this country and how we do need to have a, pro- a process and um, a policy or a platform that's specific to those communities. And for African-Americans who did not come here freely, mm-hmm. we came here as slaves, we did not come here on vacation to work for 400 years and receive no sort of form of compensation to an entity like the United States government they should be compensated for if it, to your point if it was a private entity if it was an agency if it was a, a corporation we would all be fighting hands in hands um, I think when white folks are angry or who push back against reparations they feel like somebody is going into their pockets and taking money out versus recognizing that this has nothing to do with you <laughs> right but you know as well as I do when you bring up race to even some white people on the left, but more in the center and the right, they become defensive. Yeah. And there's this book, White Fragility, I'm going to try to get the author on, but I've seen that firsthand all the time where you talk to people and it also becomes like, well, my grandparents didn't own any slaves or whatever the issue might be. We yeah. never did that. We don't have white privilege. I'm like, you've got white privilege. You don't even know you have white privilege. But yeah. that's a different conversation. But that's, so that's the hardest thing, having these conversations. You know, there's a professor from Duke, Professor William Darity, who said, in his view, debt reparations is a three-part program. The first is acknowledgement. The mm-hmm. second is redress, which would be a government program. And third would be closure. I don't know how you get the closure, but in any event, clearly the first two are the primary. One is an acknowledgement. So has the federal government, has our government ever acknowledged slavery and that they defended it in the original constitution that our framers drafted? No. I mean, oh. and also if you think about it, they're still defending it. It's still in the constitution that the only way you can be slaves is unless you're a criminal. You're a part of the criminal justice system. You are right. working for free, free for the government. So we're still to this very day, years later, supporting the idea of slavery. And there's no, there's never been an opportunity for healing, uh, healing and reconciliation in a way that allows for communities to be like, we've done, we've done harm and we're still doing harm. And this is how we're going to, um, to make it right. It's how much of an issue, you know, when I was speaking to Mark Thompson, I had a caller a few minutes ago, Stan, who kind of echoed it. Like, it's an important issue, but there was a concern that there are some people who are not well-intentioned who are bringing this up in an effort to divide the African-American community going to 2020. Because this has never been talked about robustly yeah. by the mainstream candidates. Now it seems to have been thrust on them. So now the media narratives being the, the way they are, they go, oh, that guy asked about mm-hmm. reparation. I got to ask the candidate about reparations now. So you have these discussions about it. Uh, is there any concern from your point of view that that's what it's about or is that some people not wanting that's their way of not, not having that conversation? Yeah. People keep saying we got to continue to push it, push the bucket down the line. At what point is it OK for black people to talk about what has done, been done to them? And also the idea that if we talk about one specific issue is going to divide people, every single issue is going to divide people. Like no one it has consensus on any one issue in this country. Right. And I think we as Democrats particularly have to go to bat and say this is how this is where we draw the line in the sand. These are the issues we find important because they're important to our constituents. And also, if you think about who is the, the backbone of the Democratic Party are black women who oftentimes have to bear the burden, the trauma of what the U.S. government has done to black communities. And so I think if they really want to open that door and really allow for these voices to be to be heard they need to have a platform that reflects those concerns it's going to be and what you're getting at is something we've had this conversation african-american women number one supporters of the democrats then men number two mm-hmm. african-american men and that you're not you're you're owed things from the democratic party it's not like you're asking anything you're owed you are i don't want to use the word entitled because that sounds weird but you should be making asks. Every minority community yeah. does make asks of, and I've learned about this now, and I'm sure there's some African-American leaders who must make some that they get in a campaign and say, look, if you win, we, we'd we like you to consider a Supreme Court justice who's African, or whatever it might be. I mean, look at Obama. He Even he was afraid to put forth a black woman as a Supreme Court judge, even though he was pushed by his, by his coalitions to do so. Like, even he was afraid as a black man, as the first black president, to be seen as a black candidate. And you would think that, of course, we got you there. There would be some level of a platform that reflects that. And... To be honest, I think most black community most black communities felt like they got nothing out of the deal. Really? I, when I when I was going around and something that people don't talk about enough is when I was traveling for Hillary during the campaign, there were so many older folks who had not voted for, at all during their for a long time, and they voted for the first time during Barack Obama, first two times, and they were so 
dis- dissuaded from the political process because they felt like they had gotten nothing out of the guy that looked like them. And so there was no way they were going to come out for a woman who they who they already had disagreements with or there was something that they li- disliked about her. And so I think we don't talk about that enough. The fact that there are many black people and their lives, if we look at the data, much of their lives have not changed. If anything, in some communities, it got worse. I want to have no. That's fair. That's fair. you know. So yeah, my hand is hear. out. I, I have it out. You should if be. If someone I wants know, to pay back my student having... loans, Sally May is still calling. The federal government is calling. I'm here. That's all right. So uh, we'll take a call or two because there's someone right on point here about what we were talking about. Is this an, a way to try to divide the African American community so they don't come out? Here's Robert from Miami. Robert, how are you? Yes, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate you taking my call. It's such a fascinating discussion. I want to make three quick points. I'm a 63-year-old African-American man, Okay. uh, so I'm a little pre-millennial, obviously. (laughs) You're a millennial Um, in spirit. In spirit, yes, I am. (laughs) Um, The the, the first point is is, is the point you you introduced me with, that I I really think that when I first heard this discussion come up, I said, oh, no. Here we go. This is this is a way to kneecap the black uh, candidates for president, and it's a way to to pit the black community against itself in many mm-hmm. ways, and also to help fire up white voters against black people and the, mm-hmm. and, the and the interests that black people have. Uh, the the second point I think is that one of the things that I have a problem with uh, when it comes to reparations is once you pay the reparations, however it's done. I don't think that's going to end racism in this country, but it's going to end the argument because we're going to, anytime anything comes up about racism, the answer is going to be, well, we paid reparations, leave us alone. Okay. Um, and, and one last point. Sure. No, that's uh, a great I, point, Robert. Okay. Okay. And I also, I did ancestry DNA uh, recently and I found out that as I expected, I was like 65% uh, African derivative, mm-hmm. but I also found out that I'm 19% Scandinavian and so I'm wondering who's going to qualify for reparations. Could it be anybody who says, "Hey, I did ancestry and I have five percent African blood. Why don't I qualify?" Uh, and so I think that's going to. I think that this is just going to get more and more. I mean, I think it's a great philosophical discussion. Right. But I think as a political discussion, I think it is dangerous, and I think it's going to hurt Democrats. I've been a lifelong Democrat. I don't want to see this happen. So for you, the idea of reparations being an issue is not one of the top ones for 2020. Oh, it's, it's not an issue for okay. me. I don't think I don't think this should even be part of the political discussion in this race because I think this is what Democrats have to do is find a way to pull together and, as one of your earlier callers, get rid of this person in office uh, in the in the in the White that's, House. That's what we need to focus on. I can. I think. I think internally, the Democratic Party can definitely have an internal conversation on what it means for a party to to support and or create a strategy for how they would deal with the question of reparations. I think that's legitimate. I do, and I think they can do that while also battling an incompetent Cheeto in the White House. Um, and so, my concern with racism. I mean, racism and reparations are not the same thing. Reparations is the payment for harm that have been done and inflicted by the I U.S. government. For 400 years of slavery. And so my only concern, and I hear your points, I think they're very good points too. Uh, My only concern is that if it's not appropriate now, when? Like, if it's not appropriate now in 2019, when folks are still to this day feeling the repercussions of slavery, when folks, when hundreds of thousands of people are still incarcerated to this day, mostly African Americans are still feeling the repercussions of slavery, when will be the right time for black people to to find any sort of healing and reconciliation for the harm that is done to their communities? When? Because every single time well, well, someone well, will well, say it's okay. not the right time. Well, no, well, that's, that's, exact, that's not really the argument I'm, I'm saying. I'm not saying push this down the road and talk and wait till a better time. I think because the, the issue you talk about, like the, you know, the incarcer- incarceration rates and things like that, those are, those are issues we can definitely talk about. Yes. But putting it in the context of reparations, I mean, there are poor people who are not black, and I, I, I would like to help them just as much. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know I, I'm black myself, obviously. Everybody in my family is black. Uh, and I, Except you know, for the Scandinavian interest, folks. But, <laughs> don't but forget I, about the Scandinavians. Sorry, I said, don't forget about your Scandinavian folks down the line somewhere. Well, yeah, well hey, I, you know, I, 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 I've never, until I did the ancestry DNA, I didn't exactly relate to that. I didn't <laughs> even know that was there. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, but the point is that I think there are ways we can solve the social issues in this country, the incarceration rates, the, and, and, and even address racism without putting in the context of reparations. 
No, they don't have to be in the context, but it's a reflection of the fact that where African-Americans are and how the polities are structured is based on 400 years of slavery. It's based on the systematic systems that were put into place and and recognizing that we do still in the United States have some form of slavery. Like we can't say we want to fix criminal justice reform. I mean, we want to create criminal justice reform by changing the courts and or eliminating certain laws without recognizing that there are folks incarcerated who have a check by their name every time they apply for a job Mm -hmm. because of some form of slavery and also my biggest concern about the idea that this is not the right time or we can't talk about reparations because it's going to divide people why do black people have to constantly suffer for the entire population of of people for the sake of the party when the party has never suffered for the sake of black folks when we have built an entire country when an entire country has been built on the backs and the rape and pillage of and of separations of families and communities we're in in there are huge repercussions for that. The fact that African Americans in the United States don't even know where they're from, who can't point to their grand, their great grandfather because of, of, of separations on slave on I slave can't. plantations. I, I know what you're talking about because I can't either. But um, you know, the, you know, the, the I, you know, I think I, the points you're making are, are are fine. And you know, again, I, I I just think that the way that the the argument is framed is 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 injurious to us, and I think it's being used against us. That's, for this particular purpose. Right. And, and it's know, interesting you're saying exactly what Mark said. And, and from, yeah. from an outsider looking in, I can see how that can be used. The other side, I can see how, you know, it's fine the time for Democrats to talk mm-hmm. about this issue because we, we're a more progressive party at this place. You know, Stan was on earlier, he was African-American man who called and said, look, I want to beat Trump. And then when we beat Trump and maybe we have the Senate, then we can talk about this. But then again, you do, you keep putting things off. We it, have Barack Obama a, and the Senate and I, the House. Y'all. Well, and so the, I, mean, so I think the only reason why this is being used against us is if the, the Democratic Party came out as a party in a consensus. The problem is that they are they are arguing amongst each other about what they technically know is the right thing to do. So I think what they need to do is go behind closed doors and say, this is where we all agree on reparations, because most of them agree that there's something needs to be happening for most of the minorities, the most the poorest and uneducated population in this country. And then there are some who are saying, let's put together a commission. If they all came out and say, let's at the very least put together a commission, right. it could not be used against them. Right. And that's the, the bill from John right. Conyers, which is yeah. talks about having a commission to study. Because it, it seems to be something that needs a, a great deal of mm-hmm. research. And recommendations. Bring a lot yeah. of voices in and come out with certain recommendations. Some people are going to like, some are not going to like. I don't think the Democratic 2020 candidates are going to solve it when they're just asked on the spot quickly <laughs> yeah. and they're using it to score right. points back and forth with each other when Julian Castro goes after Bernie, which I don't mm-hmm. mind. That's the Democrats. But then he's like, he won't write a check for it. And then they ask him, do you want to write a check? He goes, no, I'm not sure about a check either. <laughs> but I'm like, well, then you're just, you're just using this issue as a wedge between other Democrats. And that's, that, yeah. that's life. That's politics. It's, it's not vicious. That's just life. I just thought it was funny to hear Julian <laughs> Castro do that. So. Well, the, you know, the idea of a commission, I think, is great. You know, to study this, to, to put an intellectual turn on it, mm-hmm. I think is fine. And, and, and I, just one last point I wanted to make about Barack Obama. I think that if he had not had to fight with a Congress that he no longer controlled after his first two years, I think we would have seen a lot more from him. He really basically couldn't mm-hmm. do anything I those agree. last six years. And I, I think agree. he would have done a lot more for the black community if he had had that. I, I think agree. he would have done more for the black community. The whole the entire nation would have been, the things country, would have been, yeah, exactly. you know, so, all right, yeah. Robert, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. So that was very thought provoking with Robert. Very no, interesting it was to very hear good discussion. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our friend Jamira Burley right here on the Dean Obidala Show. The Dean Obidala Show. I think Trump clips that they play on the media should come with a health warning saying that if you watch this, you'll get dumber. Never has somebody said so much stupid in so little time as Donald Trump does. Sirius XM Progress.
And now, more of the Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM's Progress. And welcome back to Dean Obidala Show, where we solve the, solve the world's problems in three hours or less <laughs> every day. We're here with Jameer Burley talking. We were talking about reparations. All right, maybe we'll talk for another minute or two about it, but I, there's all the people on hold want to talk about it. But I, I, I do want to bring you here not just to talk about a, a black issue per se. I want to talk about a whole bunch of issues, specifically millennial, because that's what I'm, I'm pigeonholing you as a millennial, not as a black person. It's totally fine. So, uh, I mean, the last thing I'll, 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 I want to ask is that you know, there's... Kendall, we're not taking Kendall's call, but he, in the notes, he has this comment that you hear, it's a cliche from certain white people. They're sick and tired of hearing about slavery. And, and I'm sure you've heard that. They're also sick and mm-hmm. tired of hearing of Black Lives Matter. Yeah. They're also sick and tired of about racism and discrimination. I, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing about slavery, too. I wish it never happened to my people. Like, yeah. I wish we never had to endure 400 years of slavery and hundreds of years of Jim Crow and decades of fucking police brutality. I wish all of those things also did not exist, too. And I think it's convenient when folks can say, let's stop talking about it because they don't have to deal with the, the generational trauma and repercussions of what it means to have ancestors who were ripped away from their homeland, their language was stolen from them, their history was stolen from them, their children were taken at at will their women were raped their men's were disenfigured um, so it's easy and what I will say is that it's not just 400 years we're talking about systems in, in a country that was built on the backs of individuals who never were given their due and to this day are seen as a burden to America versus a part of its very fabric very well put my friend welcome and to my TED talk that was very good <laughs> and no, I, I find it so interesting every time there's an issue with race in this country they'll poll African Americans and white people is this a good time to talk about race and African Americans every time 75-80% say yeah white people it's always below 50% and and that's just basically the progressives because yeah. conservatives never want to talk about it and when we raise the issue we are called divisive like we're divisive yeah. for raising discrimination and racism and bigotry but I think white people should want to talk about it more because it's not just black people who were harmed we're also about talking about white people who were told for so long that they were superior like that something in your psyche is wrong and in, in, in the in the efforts of it you also were discriminated against you also were put into very broke down poor communities told that b- even if you're still poor you're better than white black people right. and you, the government still took advantage of you and imagine if we as a country had an honest moment to talk about race in this country and how we're actually more similar than not <laughs> right? right that we all came from africa in the long sk- scheme of things and yeah, that's a yeah so historic so we really i think white people should want to talk about it because it had also intellectually has harmed them and only has created more barriers in this country that allow for the rich one percent to stay rich while the rest 99 percent of us to be poor and fighting for the scraps at the bottom I think it's uh, remarkable and interesting to me that you talk about the burden on the white people of doing this racism. And and James Baldwin writes about yeah. the, that idea. And I'm like, I was wondering when I read it, because he was writing it at the time, like in the 60s, was he just trying to build bridges with white people by saying that? Or was that sincere? Because I'm like, why would you care about the burden on them? They're being racist. They're being oppressors. They're supporting Jim Crow. I would not care about my oppressor in yeah. any regard. I'd be like, these are horrible people. But the so oppressor is often being oppressed. Well, no, but I was wondering fashion, yeah. when James Bond was writing about it, and others did yeah. too, saying the burden on the what, how it hurts white people to have racism, and others who are African American have written about that, and I'm always amazed by that. They go, why do you? I don't care. This burden. You're almost saying like, I, you know, they're. I don't want to say we're not comparing it. We're saying that they are they're hurting too. It's the same thing with Toni Morrison. I don't think they're said. hurting. They're 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 no, they're horrible. hurting. No, they're not hurting in a different people, way. Folks. I'm yeah. talking about specifically these people were involved in oppressing black yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. In general. I think I think they're hurting in a sense of how can you truly be happy? Like how can you ever fully reach some level of happiness? Like in some form of fashion, I think people are mentally fucked up too. And it's the same thing with Toni Morrison, which I think resonated with me as an 18 year old going to college learning about my history is this idea she said to be if if the only way for you to feel tall is to to stand on someone else there is something really really wrong with you like mentally there is something wrong with you and we have to address that and and that's the trump 2016 platform and 2020 platform which really is yeah you know there is no race is a social construct is a a cliche but it's Mm -hmm. absolutely true there's no biological superiority between our races yeah and that's been dispelled as old horrible lying social science by people like charles murray and other horrible racists and trump buys into that Mm -hmm. because there's no doubt there's a reason why he calls maxine waters low iq and african-americans dumb and and unintelligent that comes right out of Mm -hmm the fake science 
of the white supremacist world where they would, like these guys, Charles Murray, who actually had a PhD, and you see white supremacists copying that. That's not true. And and we were talking earlier, like, I am the living, breathing manifestation as racist social construct because I, I literally was a white guy before <laughs> September 11th. I lived a white guy life. All my friends had names like Monica and Chandler and Joey. They were just a white world. And then, Did you have to turn in your white card? They took it. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to keep it. White people, if you don't think you have white privilege, if you lost it, like I lost it, you would know what it is because that's really my life. Mm-hmm. Because it simply means white privilege. I'm my, I have my own, forget academic discussions. To me, it's simply being treated the way you should be treated. That's simply that you're judged on you, Mm -hmm. what you've done right or you've done wrong, not the worst of any community. And that's the world that as a minority now, and now I accept it, I'm a minority, I I define myself as a minority regardless of my skin color. Because again, it's not biological. My skin color is meaningless because Mm -hmm. I am demonized for the worst of my community. I am religiously profiled because of the worst of my community. I've been hate crimes, neo-Nazis literally wanted to kill me a year ago, mm-hmm. death threats, because I'm Muslim and I wrote about them. White people, you don't deal with that and and you shouldn't have to. Nobody should. No That's one my point. should. Like, yeah. like saying you should suffer that. No one said you should have worse conditions. We're right. literally just saying, can can we get into the club too? Like, can we? <laughs> I was in the club. Look, the club is you pretty were, good. You were, and now the club is it's shut free, down and moved locations and you don't there's know like, where the location is. free water, you get all this snacks, a lot of pretzels, a lot of, you're hanging out, you go to Abercrombie and Fitch, they give you a discount, they wink, they come in. Put you're, the sunblock on your nose, you're right, now chilling. The whole, but then everything changed. So I, so I am so obsessed with the race people know who listen to the show i'm obsessed with the race because i've lived two different lives and i'm not even and it's not even like me framing it in a way that's interesting like literally my life was as i tell people like september 10th i went to sleep a white guy september 11th i woke up an arab and that's the world that's the mm-hmm. short concise way but it took so many years people loved you until they wanted to kill you that well put and that's exactly so <laughs> and that's why when i read you know mlk i looked at african-american writers in our, my experience, I'm not black. You know, it's not that. The, our, my experience is unique, and I try to make sense of it by reading African Americans yeah. who have been through it. Mm-hmm. So that's why I read James Baldwin and, and, and a lot of stuff from the '60s. Like I'm really intrigued. Michael Eric Dyson has a great book about the meeting, the famous meeting with RFK, <sighs> and speak. And this is what truth sounds like. And yeah. I'm like, wow, that's what exactly. So these things inspire me because mm-hmm. my community has not had a chance to write these books because none of us, yeah, the ones born here like me, really we thought we were white. My name mm-hmm. legally is Dean. That's it's not like my mo- my father wanted Salah Dean, but but my mom <laughs> wanted me. Be able to fly so she's like that's not gonna happen and so that's your mom saved you she did, oh, oh my god for my last name people don't notice my last name has the word Allah in it especially because my first name is legally Dean and I look white yeah. to people or I look Italian because I'm half Italian I if thought my, you were too I'm half Italian yeah. but when if you saw Salah Dean all, all of a sudden the Allah part would jump out and, and the, my name would be yeah I did not know that for so, a very long time my name is servant of Allah all right we're not gonna make this about me but but Jim that's why like I'm obsessed with, and I feel on some level that maybe I can reach some white people, not really right wingers, but other ones who get up defensive about white privilege. And for me to explain, like I had it, mm-hmm. and I know what it's gone, and I can explain to you yeah. literally what it was. And they might go, maybe they won't be defensive about it because I think you can reach certain people, not all people. Yeah, some people. That's all. I think people just need to realize that whenever we're having a conversation around what's due to minority communities, it's not like we're asking to take it from you. We're saying that we have been given, all of us, have been given the bottom 10% of resources, services, and access. Unfortunately, you've gotten more of that 10%. But what we're saying is that all of us should be getting more. And particularly African Americans, the the avenue and the pathway to get more has to be, we have to have an honest conversation around race in this race and class in this country that has never ha- happened before. When you look at Trump, I mean, when you... I try not to look at him, I'm but sorry. Okay. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you hear the, the, the stuff he has said, that does it resonate with you as being parroting white supremacy? Or do you think he's just someone who's uninformed? Or is it truly from a place of racism? And I don't care what's in his heart. I'm saying from what you hear. Because I, I, I've interviewed people like... Yeah. You know, Geraldo Herrera, who knows mm. him, and uh, Anthony Scaramucci. Like, oh, he's a good guy in his heart. I'm like, I don't give a shit about his heart. I hear what's coming out of his lips. That's all that matters to me. He's present. When you hear it, what, what does it sound like to you? I think what he says is his heart. What do you right. mean? Anyone who in your heart is reflected in your words and actions. And for me, if Donald Trump is just using this as a way to pander to white supremacy individuals and organizations... That makes him even more disgusting to me, as far as I'm concerned, even more disgusting because he knows what he is doing is potentially putting individual lives at risk for vote 
for potential for the potential of being president and having power. And so I'm, I reflect on the fact that his policies have been just as discriminating as his actual words. I mean, he used to write C on on individuals' um, uh-huh. applications for housing. He treated he <laughs> doesn't have many African American employees. Um, he's done multiple things, and how he's referred to African Americans and what the whole ad that he took out for the Central Park Five really. Like, really? Even and has never apologized for that. Like he literally made sure that these young boys who turned out to not be guilty had death threats and individuals calling for them to be sentenced to life behind bars. And there was never any healing reconciliation for that, which is very reflective of this country. Right. We demonize individuals who are who are i.e. different, but then never recognize the contributions that they've made to this country to make it what it is and the privileges they're able to access. So Donald Trump can kick rocks with no shoes on and 90 degree weather <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. No, I didn't expect you to say anything. No, no, no. I, I was just wondering when you hear things, you really touched on the idea. Does it, I, I don't, it does not matter to me if it's opportunistic racism yeah. or it's heartfelt racism. It's racism. It's, the same it's bigotry thing. and he's emboldening the worst people. And I tell people all the time, I would, I've written articles about the last few presidents. I've never had death threats in my life, yeah. even as a Muslim, about defending Muslims. The time of Trump, yes, things have changed. But I'm not, and part of me doesn't even blame Trump. I think America created Trump. I think there was a population of America who believes what he believes, right? And he catered to that population more so. It was like, is his grand idea of how to win an election. He saw what was working. He saw the language that was working. He saw what areas of the country was working for. Right. And he tapped into that. We, and, and because we don't have conversations of reparations and because we don't have conversations about race, we thought that all those people had died off until 2016, where they all showed up in numbers with their Confederate flag and their bumper sticker, Make America Great Again. It will be interesting if reparations becomes an issue on the national platform where Trump's got to respond to it. And and I and <laughs> what I, if he comes out and say I have a plan for reparations? Right, right, imagine then that. it's gonna be sh- a shit show. Uh, because uh, there's no he he can't be He's shrewd. He's the pander of all he panders. He can't do it because look his base really is a core of white Americans. That's clearly the, the exit poll shows that. So it's not me speculating. We know that. And like all Republicans, frankly, he didn't do much better with white people than Mitt Romney. It's not people have this yeah. sense that he got ninety percent of white people. He didn't. He got slightly more than Mitt Romney did. But a lot of them are looking to him this, as the white savior. And the build the wall is Trump about- Trump to save right, you? Right. It's, it's, that's, <laughs> so that's the wall. That's what it's about. So And getting rid of family. He calls it you know chain migrations, family unifications, for the reason my family's here. Um, so you go through all the stuff he talks about. If he came out in favor of reparations, I don't think any black person would be- fooled by it. He would only do it for his white base again, like some of the things he's done to show, I'm not a racist. Look, I'm in favor of reparations. Exactly. I wonder- Which I, makes Democrats look crazy because they don't have a strategy. That's what I'm saying. Right. It's like, That's imagine Trump Good doing point. something just so he could appear to be not racist. And and it would play into his role saying the Democratic Party is actually more racist than the Republican Party, right? Right. Because <laughs> they haven't done, because many people speculate they haven't done more or less than the Republican Party to help or hinder African Americans from being able to succeed. So it's like. Is that true? What do you think? I think they've definitely done more. I wouldn't be a part of a party that I didn't think has potential and has elevated African Americans in a way where it's reflective in the policies and practices, both on the local and federal level. Do I think they can do more? Hell yeah. And I think that if they listen to their base. If they are willing to have honest conversations, we can potentially win this. There, there is such a disconnect, and I saw it when I first started hosting this show last, not last May, the May before, mm-hmm. and I was listening to callers who were very progressive, and what they were saying was so different, and we were in the minority then, but so different than what Chuck Schumer was saying and what his minority leader at the time, yeah. Pelosi and others, because they were just doing the normal establishment stuff, mm-hmm. and with the energy beneath the surface, and that's the energy that took us to win in 2018 yeah. was different. And and, and th- they've embraced the agenda shifting. The, the agenda mm-hmm. has shifted and they are. Um, and I wonder in 2020 for some of these establishment Democrats, and I wonder for like, like when we come back, let's talk about the 2020 race about Joe Biden. It looks like the reporting is Beto O'Rourke might announce tomorrow. And I don't he know how it's- He needs to take a seat. Um, he he I'll hasn't pull even announced out, yet. I'll pull out the seat for him. <laughs> so he might have been And I like him, but I think I will pull out a seat for well, him. Well, let's take a break. <laughs> Find out. We'll, we'll do a seats. segment. <laughs> Who Jameer is going to pull a seat for when we come back after Every this white break? Man. <laughs> Progressive values are the best of American values, and we need to keep fighting for them to save our country. Don't go anywhere. This is the Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
You're listening to The Dino Bidala Show, Sirius XM's Progress. And welcome back, Dino Bidala Show. Here at Jamira Burley, my friends, we're having a very spirited conversation about race. Here's the weirdest this thing. This is the generational divide People right could, here. <laughs> where I could talk about race like all day, nonstop, because I'm obsessed with it. And that's and I don't want to get into making it about me, because it, it quickly goes yeah. into like, because I'm here to talk about the African-American community. And now let's shift gears and talk about y- you as an amalgam of things, as a millennial, as a woman, African-American as well. And simply as an American, we're looking at the 2020 race really mm-hmm. heat up. Tomorrow, Beto O'Rourke might announce. There are some people excited about him. I will tell you, I've had literally one call of someone <laughs> saying they like Joe Biden. No, Beto people have. Uh, Joe Biden, that was by a center, slightly centerist Democrat from Oklahoma, only because I kept saying no one ever calls. Yeah. And he called to go, I like him. I'm not saying I dislike Biden. That's not what it's about. I'm talking about where the energy is, because that tends to be who wins primaries. Mm-hmm. Well, who... Is there someone that you already like or are you waiting for the field? of? The, I mean, out? I like a lot of people. I like Castro. I like Harris. I like potentially Abrams if she throws her hat in the race. I like Beto. Do I think he should run for president? No. Sorry. What do you think he should do? Run for Senate? I think he John should Corn? finish getting his... I think he has the potential to move Texas to be more purple, than, if not blue. And I think there's something to be said about... I also think there's something to be said about if you are running for a presidential can, as a presidential candidate, can you win your state? Can you pull your state? And this, and this, I would say the same thing for Abrams. I would say the same thing for Andrew Gillums. I would say the same thing for Beto. Like all of them lost their state, and yeah, they won in, in vast, I mean, in huge numbers in some way. But like in a presidential election, we're talking about Florida, Georgia, and Texas, three very important states in a presidential election. So it's like, is the conversation only of one of the three is in play, Florida? Yeah. And, I, and I'm fearing that Florida won't be in play. And I, I have a feeling that I Ohio feel like is less either. and less in play. But yeah. but then again, we could lose those and win Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And my we, crazy state. Which one? <laughs> Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. That's is that, Pennsylvania is crazy. <laughs> it, well, it's gone blue. it's gone blue in the past. Let, I don't want to break it down. A tor- but yeah, lecture. I do like a whole bunch of candidates. I think the more candidates do allow for a more robust conversation, allows for topics like reparations to enter into the national debate. Um, I, for me, as someone who is very well versed in politics, who cares about politics, who goes to sleep watching MSNBC, I think there's something to be said, especially in in the Trump era, that we need a president who can actually understand foreign and domestic policy, who can be both an ambassador as well as a negotiator, and who isn't racist. Is so you're going to wait for the debates, right? June, we get amazing thing. Mm-hmm. It all starts. Yeah. Well, are you might endorse. Uh, will you I'm work looking, on a campaign? I mean, you worked on Hillary's. Would you actually go staff, work on a staff? I think it would depend. Uh, as someone who's heavily focused on like women and girls, boys and men of color and like gun violence, I would have to be in a position where I felt like I could be in someone's ear and be like, don't say that because that will be oh, wrong. You really want, right. Yeah, I would. That's the only way I could throw my or I was running youth engagement. But we'll see. I don't know. I haven't seen a candidate that would be like, mm, I will quit my job, my very lucrative job, to take a pay really? cut. Really? <laughs> wow. Because that's what I would have to do. I would have to take a pay cut. Because and- you work yeah. on a campaign, of course. That would yeah. Be- it's interesting that Stacey Abrams went from, I'm not going to run till 2028, to people go like, what? She goes, okay, I'll run now. Like, it was very a weird thing. She went from, she literally said, I think, 2028. Yeah. And then she goes, well, I'm not going to say I won't run. I have to say, and I'm just saying from just l- l- hearing people talk about different candidates, if she ran, she would bring so much energy to the race, and it could pose problems for Senator Harris, Kamala Harris, not because they're both black women, but because that part of it, I have to be frank, but I think also the idea of energy, you're bringing energy, and some of the energy around Senator Harris might go to Stacey Abrams, Yeah, and I think she would, I, I don't know how else, it, like when, if Beto runs, mm-hmm. and if Biden runs, they're, all, they're in similar lanes in that yeah. Biden's probably more centrist left, and Beto is certainly not as progressive as everyone Thinks he is, right? That's right? The thing. Everyone thinks like <laughs> everyone thinks, but he, he might is. move to the left to run for president. That's yeah. the other thing he could, because he might say in Texas, I had to do this to almost win. I had no choice. Here's what I'm really about. To be honest, if if both Stacey and Harris are in the race, I think it actually gives more of us us as black women a more opportunity to either be somewhere on the ticket as a president or a VP. Definitely. Because I think that both of them are highly qualified. They both will bring in a huge population of the Democratic voters to actually show up on election day. And black women will pull their families in to vote. And I think that I, yeah, I like both of them. So I'm I'm here she, for all the melanin possible. <laughs> all of it. She was great in the State of the Union response. They so said, good. She got introduced to America that way. And 
the calmness and her demeanor was like there was she's like giving a speech to a few people. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, was, the nation she was making history. The first yeah. black woman to ever give the response on either side. It's not going to happen on the right side. Um, and she, like many other candidates, are, is someone that came from the community. She right, right, she she's used not. to work as an activist in the community, building coalitions, creating relationships, raising money for real issues, and then creating pathways for individuals to vote. And so I think that would be a different type of candidate. You you had tweeted, the shift gears a little bit, we have a few minutes, but someone made this point earlier, and I was glad you were here to talk about this. Paul Manafort, you tweeted that white privilege will get you three years for treason, but Khalif Browder did more than that for the accusation of stealing a backpack. Please yep. explain. It's it's what we know is what's wrong with the criminal justice system, that every single time where you have an individual, particularly a white man, who does some heinous, heinous crime, um, the onus or the repercussions for that crime is nowhere near as severe as individuals who've done very minor crimes, like having a pack of weed in their pocket or being accused of stealing a backpack as a 17 or 17 or 16 year old and having to spend three years in one of the most severe prisons in the United States. And there's never any conversation around. And this again goes back to reparations, how this country and its systems that have upheld power have discriminated against minorities in a way that can be life or death and have can um, contributed to the fact that there are women who try to vote in an election in this country and she should be given the right to vote even if she is a crim- even if she does is an ex offender how she was given 5 years and you had an individual who was selling secrets and lobbying for a foreign government receiving less than 6 years in prison it boggles my mind but i hear the state of new york is about to come for his bag so i'm here for they it they did indict him today <laughs> right they indicted him in new york so that trump making it clear to donald trump that you can pardon your criminal friends we're still going to get them no one's escaping justice and i thought that was really important and manafort i mean i had my friend danny savalas on yesterday who's a lawyer who said that in prison it takes, and this is all studies, it takes two years of your life away, one year, like one physical year, the, yeah. the trauma it does to you. So a man like Paul Manafort, he's his first sentencing of four years is probably a life sentence. Now with mm-hmm. seven, and he gets nine months for a time served, it, he would probably die in prison. But I thought it was interesting on the bigger picture when you think about people going to prison, black, brown, white, mm-hmm. that what it takes out of them from a trauma point of view. If you're sentenced to three years, it's not just three years. It's really yeah. six years of your life expectancy has been taken from you. Yeah, and you, then you, they push you back into the community with no resources to actually be able to survive and thrive. And if anything, you just come right back to the system. So let's take a quick Slavery break. Slavery in modern, modern form. Well, let, let's take a quick break. Come back with more of the Dean Obadala Show. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
Dean Ogadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. You're in a special diet, you have to low sodium, or you're concerned about what you're eating, you have food allergies. Well, here's a place to get a box of food delivered that you know what's in it, everything in it, and you're going to cook it. And it couldn't be simpler. You can cook most meals in 20 minutes or less. It's HelloFresh.com. It's America's number one meal kit. And they have a remarkable, if you like, say you like simple things like meatloaf. They've got a great meatloaf recipe. It's a grandma's meatloaf thing. I just got it the other day. To chicken, to pizza with tomato and zucchini, to vegetarian, to fish dishes, you name it, they have it, individual or family size. And you can try it now for 20 bucks off your first three boxes, which is almost trying it for free. I'm not kidding. So you can check it out and they know you're going to love it and subscribe. How do you do that? Simple. Go to HelloFresh.com. Slash Dean, that's H-E-L-L-O, fresh dot. Two minutes, the college scams. Is that more white privilege on display? What do you think? By oh, any my God. It's like if you, I'm just trying to figure out how bad of a student your kid has to be that you have to pay millions of dollars to get them into a college that you end up paying more than the college tuition actually would charge. I just think it's disgusting, and I think it is just another clear indication of how America has given us a lie that if you work hard, you will be able to be successful when really all you have to do is pay to get at the front of the line. A half a million dollars. One parent paid six million dollars. I'm like, I how? Know. I don't want to be rude, but how dumb was your kid? I mean, six million. But imagine if you just got that person a damn tutor, or like <laughs> killed. I mean, like, or donated a million to the school. You'd probably get him in for two million to the yeah, school. Yeah, you could have got a school library named after your family at that and cost. Let your kids go in. So I think it's remarkable. That was such a white privilege parade to the point where the U.S. Attorney and I played the clip <laughs> yesterday. Who was a white guy going, this is ridiculous. It's like privilege on parade. This is the worst thing. You know, like we don't have two standards of school mm-hmm. systems. And my sister's got three little girls and one's in junior in high school in up there. And I go, what do you think of this? And she goes, you know, her daughter's like, does that mean when I apply to school, if we don't have these ridiculous coaches that you pay a ridiculous amount of money, I won't get a fair <laughs> shot at this? Basically. And... <laughs> So, all right, Jameer, thank you very much for coming in, spending an hour here in studio. It was great meeting you in person. Tell people on Twitter where you are so they can follow. You can follow me on all forms of social media when they (laughs) get back online, at Jameer Burley. So, Jameer, thank you very much. Look forward to chatting with you. Folks, we'll take a break. We're going to come back with more talking about this topic and more. we got Ellie Mastal for a little bit and Aisha Moody-Mills right here on the Dino Bidala Show. 